Welcome to Stigma Shattered, a podcast where we talk about mental health. At Stigma Shattered, we want to raise awareness about the various aspects of mental illness, so each week we will delve into a different topic related to mental health. This is our first episode, and my name is Kirthi, your host. Let me tell you a little bit about myself and why I wanted to start this podcast. I have what my psychiatrist calls severe treatment-resistant bipolar depression and I've been struggling with mental illness for the past 11 years. I've been through 8 programs, 5 psychiatrists, and 11 straight years of therapy, so I've got some experience. It all started for me when I was 14. At the time, my dad was struggling with cancer and I was moving to a new high school, two stressors that compounded to break me. I'm an introvert, so I really struggled to make friends starting at the new school. My memory of the time is really foggy, and depressing influencing memory is something we'll talk about later in another episode, but I know that I gradually started slipping into a very dark place. I had no concept of mental health at this point, so I just went about suppressing my emotions and going through the motions. I remember reading a lot though. Every conscious moment I could, I would distract myself with some fantasy novel or the other. By sophomore year, I started not doing my schoolwork or handing in assignments. I remember my history teacher would send me out of the classroom every five minutes to get a drink of water because I kept falling asleep. I was also regularly dissociating and losing chunks of time. Eventually, my school mandated that I see a therapist or face academic review and possibly expulsion because I wasn't doing my work. So I did see a therapist and she told me I had depression. I lost it. I cried and screamed. Again, I knew nothing about mental illness at the time. So I asked my mom, am I crazy? I had to go on medical leave for a couple months to recover. But that was just the start of it all. I stayed depressed and I also became very volatile. I started self-harming. I would get into huge fights with my parents who, by the way, didn't really understand mental illness either. I kept pushing myself to ruin and living in the moment because I couldn't even conceive of a future. At some point I made some friends, but that ended badly as well. I don't really remember what happened, but I know it sent me to rock bottom. I developed severe social anxiety, self-hatred, and I never really made lasting friends until recently. I don't remember, but my mom says that at my graduation, no one really wanted to talk to me. I considered myself worthless and undeserving of happiness for a long time after that. After graduating high school, I went to college, and all was going well until all of a sudden, it wasn't. I dropped out and stayed at home doing odd jobs for two years, but not really working towards anything. This was one of my lowest points, though I have many. At the time, all I saw in my future was black. It is also when I attempted suicide. Then my therapist and psychiatrist at the time sent me to a residential program called Silver Hill. It changed my life. I met people, got treatment, and realized that although I was depressed, I could still live my life. I went back to school and got my associate's degree, then moved on to work on my bachelor's. I was thriving. I had a 4.0 GPA, good internships, jobs, my professors loved me, all of it. Then, of course, I got sick again, severely so this time. At this point, I had tried what feels like every medication under the planet, to little effect. So my psychiatrist started me on different treatments. I got ketamine infusions done, didn't work. Then I did ECT, also didn't work. But I ended up being part of the 1% that has severe cognitive side effects from it. And I'll talk about those treatments more in depth at a later time. After that, I went to another residential. Finally, that brings us back to now. I'm more stable, but expect to have to deal with my illness again in the future. And I decided to start this podcast because I want to make advocacy a lifelong passion. So that's it for my story. Now let's get into the science behind mental illness. Today, I want to give you all sort of an overview of mental health. We're going to get into a little bit of types of disorders, the brain, a bit of genetics, and more. To define mental illness, they are disorders that influence your mood, thinking, and behavior, and often impact a person's life. Some basic symptoms include problems or changes in behavior, eating, sleeping, relationships, substance use, sex drive, etc. There are over 450 mental disorders listed in the DSM some of which are anxiety disorders, mood disorders, trauma, dissociative disorders, and addiction. Psychologists have developed an understanding of these factors that influence mental illness called the biopsychosocial model. It looks at the intersection of biological, psychological, and social influences on individual development. 
Biological influences include your genes, prenatal development, hormones, and physiology. Psychological influences include epigenetics, early life experiences, personality, and beliefs. Social influences include family, friends, and culture. All of these come together and sometimes overlap to shape a human and their mental health. Let's talk about the brain first. The most basic component of the brain are neurons, or nerve cells, which are the fundamental units of the nervous system and have the ability to communicate with each other. These neurons send signals to each other called synaptic transmissions via chemicals called neurotransmitters, which are the mechanism through which your brain is able to understand what's happening in your body. The sometimes faulty communication between nerve cells is the cause of many mental illnesses. Imagine you're trying to catch fireflies in a jar to make a lamp. Depending on where you place your jar, you may get more or fewer fireflies, but you can only see clearly with enough fireflies. A neuron is the same. It tries to collect neurotransmitters to send signals in your brain, but if it doesn't gather enough neurotransmitters, the signal doesn't get sent. When your neurons don't fire signals correctly, you can start to experience mental illness. Of course, issues can occur when there are an excess of neurotransmitters accepted as well. So how do people treat malfunctioning neurons? Often they use medications like SSRIs or selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Serotonin is a neurotransmitter and lack of it in the brain is linked to depression. Going back to our firefly analogy, SSRIs act as an agent to keep more fireflies in the environment around the jar so that more fireflies can get into the jar and light it up. This acts to mitigate the undersupply of serotonin around the neurons and allows them to fire properly. Now, why do some people have misfiring neurons? There are a variety of factors that influence someone's predisposition to mental illness, like genetics and someone's environment. If you know three or more people in your family that struggle with mental illness, there's a strong chance that it is hereditary in your family. Environmental factors can include trauma, substance exposure, and external societal triggers. Keep in mind though that the severity of mental illness can occur on a spectrum and can be influenced by the convergence of different predispositions. Next up is psychological factors. These include things like self-esteem, coping skills, social skills, and behavior. Psychological factors overlap with biological factors in areas like intelligence, personality, health conditions, and stress. If I were to relate this domain to my personal life, I would say that the psychological factors that contributed to my illness were maladapting coping mechanisms, my stubborn personality, and my low self-esteem. Last is social environmental factors, which have things in a person's surroundings like family, peers, school life, etc. This overlaps with psychological factors for traumatic experiences, family circumstances, a person's innate motivation, and stress. It also overlaps with biological factors in areas like effects of drugs and isolation and again, stress. In my life, these factors culminated from mine and my family's lack of understanding of mental illness. You may have noticed that stress pops up quite a lot in this discourse. That's because it is a key part in an individual's mental health. Cortisol is a hormone produced by the adrenal gland when you are stressed out. A balanced amount of cortisol in the bloodstream is essential for optimal health. When an individual is exposed to prolonged stress, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, or HPA, is activated and excess cortisol gets produced. These new levels can affect one's metabolism, immune, cardiovascular, skeletal, and nervous systems. Coming back to the brain, I'd like to talk about some other complexities that influence mental illness. For example, trauma. When the brain undergoes a traumatic event, the amygdala enlarges. This makes a person's fight or flight response more immediate and explosive. Normally, the brain fires and activates the prefrontal cortex, something you can consider your rational brain. This part of the brain can evaluate your fear and temper an instinctual response to a trigger. With an enlarged amygdala due to trauma, a trigger will fire the neurons in your amygdala and will incite your immediate instinct, whether that be freezing, panic, or whatever. That's why some people have what society calls a short fuse. Well, that's it for today, guys. As you can tell, mental illness is a very complex phenomenon with a multitude of contributing factors. We've barely even scratched the surface. I hope you guys enjoyed the first episode and also learned something from it. See you next time.